Uh, yeah. Going into my oh, I'll just use the thing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I'm told that we need to start ordering more food, which is uh, fine. I'll order more. It's just a question of whether we can pay for it. But we will order more food. Um, I think it's great that we're running out of food. It shows how popular the meeting is. Nice to see a big turnout. There's always a big turnout for a visiting speaker. Uh, and we have one today in Professor Philip James, who's going to speak about oxygen and the brain. Uh, but first, the standard parish notices. So I find my script here is uh, Miles Witham, uh, who looks very pleased with himself uh, in his lab as he's proven that something isn't. Uh, this week, uh, he has led a study which shows that vitamin D is not effective in lowering blood pressure and should not be used to treat hypertension. Um, so he, uh, it's good that we've got negative studies, and the negative study bias is complicated by its own negative bias. Bruce Guthrie, here he is, looking very pleased with himself. Um, he's also in the news with a clinical guideline study which found potentially serious clashes when drugs for one condition are prescribed alongside prescribed drugs for another condition, which sounds awfully vague, uh, but clearly very important. Calling all final year students, please go online and complete the National Student Survey, uh, and you can win a ticket to a ball or an iPad. Last week we had 60% of all students had signed up, and now it's nearly 70 but as always, the dentists are still winning, so please get on to the NSS website and complete the survey. It's very important for us in the medical school to know what you think. Later in March, the Dundee-led Scottish Pain Research Community holds its fifth annual scientific meeting at West Park. Uh, and the title is Pain Research to Improve Pain Treatment. Everyone is invited, and details are on the medical school neuroscience research division page. Later in March, on the 28th, uh, Professor Dame Sally Davis will also deliver a public lecture on the risks to society of unrestricted antibiotic use, which we all know about here, uh, and I'm sure Dilip will be first in uh, to that lecture. On the 5th of May, Dr Michael Gordon, a distinguished geriatrician and palliative care specialist from Toronto's Baycrest Centre, is here to deliver a lecture entitled Managing Ethical Challenges in Late Stage Dementia. He also looks very pleased with himself, doesn't he? It's nice to see so many smiling people. For those of you who are into big data and health informatics, getting your name known and networking, we should also highlight Britain's leading data-intensive health research conference, which will take place in St Andrews in late August. Next week at Grand Rounds, uh, we have a different Professor Philip. This is Professor Philip Cahir. He's retiring this month after a long and distinguished career in haematology and then as the postgraduate dean here in the East of Scotland Deanery. And he is going to get, deliver his final lecture, um, which is from Factor 8 to Educate. And I'm sure it'll be very interesting, and I'm sure it'll be well attended. But to this week... Professor Philip James, who was the, he is an emeritus professor of medicine here at Dundee University, uh, has worked in Dundee for over 30 years, uh, and he set up the hyperbaric unit here uh, in Nine Wells. He's an internationally renowned speaker on the topic. I'm very pleased to have him, so I can introduce you, and I'll just fiddle with the IT for Professor Philip James. Absolutely. There you go. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to come back to Nine Wells. I was 33 years in this building, but having walked into this lecture theatre, I wouldn't recognise it. Uh, obviously, a very, very dramatic upgrade. Um, and it's also nice to see some familiar faces. Um, the, at the outset, I'd like to thank this university because it provided my home for so many years. And it started with a very unusual appointment because industrial medicine is not practiced very much. In those days, though, Dundee had a lot of industry and had a professor of public health who took a great deal of interest in the local industry. People like the textile industry, Sidlaw Industries and Baxter Brothers, uh, Rob Caledon, the Steelworks, Ferranti, uh, High Tech Electronics, Timex, NCR, who were making cash registers, um, a lot of people were employed in very large concerns, all of which have pretty much gone. However, being appointed in 1975 as senior lecturer in industrial health, 
um, I felt it was really essential to actually do some industrial health. In other words, to talk about something that I was doing. And I was fortunate enough through Principal Drever to get a part-time appointment. 9-11s, just like the 9-11s in NHS contracts, which gave me the freedom. Little did I realise in coming up to Scotland how I would get involved with hyperbaric medicine and the science behind it, and also learn about some extraordinary characters, one of whom spent time in University College, Dundee. So the first picture is of the space station and two astronauts locked out. On the ground you could see the, the sea. That space station has a hyperbaric chamber on board. This is it. And here's the Japanese commander who's recently left the space station talking to a Japanese robot. But this is actually a hyperbaric chamber because everybody associates, associates the bends with diving, and of course, with deep diving in particular. In reality, astronauts can get the bends, and so can pilots, military high altitude aircraft. So that obviously is a, a picture from an Apple Mac, and uh, it's a picture, obviously, of the Earth, and this is the Mississippi River, and it's just to show you this very thin rim of atmosphere which is retained by gravity. We actually live in a pressure chamber, a hyperbaric chamber. It doesn't have walls. The gas is retained onto the Earth by gravity. So gravity, atmospheric air, creates barometric pressure, and all of you, hopefully, are all breathing. So we want to discuss hyperbaric medicine. Well, then we've got to define baric medicine, and we've got to define hypobaric medicine. Well, baric medicine is what you undertake. You're working in an environment where you rely on the air to provide a reasonable amount of oxygen. Hypobaric medicine is associated with excursions to lower pressures and hyperbaric to higher pressures. Well, <clears throat> this is a weather chart of the Atlantic. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. And it shows the isobars. And here we see an isobar where every point on that line is 1,040 hectopascals or millibars, whichever you, ever you prefer. And up here, there's a low pressure area of 980. So what's the range in Scotland? Well, it's from 926 millibars to 1,055. That's an equivalent to an altitude change of 3,870 feet. So let's postulate that you're looking after somebody in intensive care who is scrabbling for every molecule to keep the brain alive and a bad weather system comes across that suddenly means your intensive care unit is transported up a mountain almost the height of Everest. But you don't think about it. A little uncomfortable to think about it because it's very clear that when someone has been asphyxiated, every oxygen molecule counts. And this difference is more than 10%. When in the death zone on Everest, a difference of 2% provided by the oxygen apparatus that climbers carry can mean the difference between staying alive and dying from either pulmonary edema or cerebral edema or both. So Everest. This is a hospital on Everest at base camp. And just like the space station, it has a hyperbaric chamber. So there it is tucked down here. And these are very simple pressure bags made of advanced materials that can increase atmospheric pressure typically by about a third over the ambient pressure. Of course, way up on the mountain, up here, you enter into the death zone of over 28,000 feet, where, of course, the oxygen partial pressure is very low 
and most climbers require supplemental oxygen to breathe. As I've already said, an addition of about 2%. However, Peter Harbler climbed Everest without supplementary oxygen in 1978, and since then, about 32 Everest climbers have succeeded in doing that. Well, it's a little bit light in here to show you these properly, but <clears throat> this perhaps is rather better. I can't see perhaps the density of the image. But I just thought I would put this image in because it shows you the cerebral cortex of a mouse and the microvasculature, the hydraulics. The capillary density is typically a thousand capillaries per cubic millimeter. It's really quite difficult to think of capillaries in that density. What does it indicate? It indicates the large oxygen demand of consciousness. Assuming that you're remaining conscious, then your cortex is demanding a lot of oxygen that's supplied by this intense microvasculature. But it's not actually static. If you're on base camp on Everest, barometric pressure is half what it is in this room. Today is pretty much a standard atmosphere. So halving barometric pressure halves the concentration of oxygen that you're breathing. And what's the body's reaction? The reaction is to increase more, more capillaries. So in the time for acclimatization, at base camp on Everest, at half an atmosphere, the yield of microvessels from the cortex, hypoxic rats, higher by 50%. Difficult to see how they can possibly get fitted in. But that really is quite extraordinary. So in reality, the changes in of barometric pressure that we experienced on terrestrial Earth, you know, if you're driving into, uh, the, the, into Nepal or going up into the Andes, the capillary count in your brain is changing. When you come back down to sea level, they'll disappear. Well, <clears throat> take us back to our roots. We all started out as a fetus, and this is five weeks post-gestation, by which time the heart is beating. And during that time, the mass of cells that came from the single cell of the fertilized ovum has formed a blastocyst, and then the cell mass increases, and it's very clear that unless you construct a hydraulic system to actually supply a wide variety of things, but principally glucose, then it can't continue to grow. And so it's rather unfortunate to say this, especially for cardiologists, but the heart is an unfortunate necessity, and so, are, so is the pipework. By the time we finish growing, we are a mass of th about three trillion cells. And it's said that the brain contains about a hundred million cells. Well, <clears throat> I certainly did not expect in getting involved with pressure and medicine and diving and North Sea activities to eventually find just how much oxygen contributes to our genome. And this discovery is really fascinating. Patients in renal dialysis become hypoxic. It's partly because of the uh, particulates in the perfusing fluid, they're getting endothelial damage, but they become hypoxic. And the response, of course, as you, I'm sure you all know, is production of EPO, which increases the red cell density and compensates. Exactly the same mechanism that occurs on Everest, because after three weeks at base camp on Everest, the, the um, volume of cells in a blood sample goes up from the 45% you have at the moment up to perhaps even as high as 65% to increase the oxygen transport of blood. So, in fact, about 20 years ago, the urologists, two groups, one in uh, Oxford and the other in Baltimore, 
began studying why is it that a fall in oxygen level, which is traditionally associated with a reduction in available energy, actually produces an increase in red cells, and for that matter, other things. It led down a road to the discovery of the hypoxia-inducible factor proteins, of which three have been identified. Now, this is from a review in Nature that my friend Van Spence gave me, and it's a very elementary <coughs> review. Having said that, the two pages in Nature took me about a week to get a grasp of. Protein hypoxia-inducible factor 1 alpha regulates the expression of over 30 genes when oxygen levels are falling. It's not an absolute value. And this figure now has gone up to 8,183 at the last count. So it's utterly central to our existence, the oxygen control of our genes. A group using a mouse knockout model, Kramer and Kramer, they also showed that this protein, which combines with one beta, controls several key aspects of inflammation. And this is a key phenomenon, something I'm going to expand on. The redness and swelling of injured tissues and the ability of leukocytes to enter these tissues. This is the primary defense mechanism in which neutrophils target infected tissue. They say, and it truly is absolutely right, striking that a single molecule should emerge as the master regulator in two di such diverse settings as hypoxia and inflammation. In fact, they're, li they're linked. I apologize for this diagram, which is from uh, Carl Nathan. And really, I only want to concentrate on this particular part of the schematic. Hypoxia or changing oxygen levels and there is vascular endothelial growth factor. So the growth of capillary network and the microvasculature of the developing embryo is controlled by oxygen and its interaction with vascular endothelial growth factor which of course is upregulated in inflammation to give redness, swelling and so on and, of course, the leukocyte migration we've already mentioned. So the paradox of life, mediated by the hypoxia-inducible factor proteins, is that less oxygen equals more of this series of proteins, 1 alpha, 2 alpha, and 3 alpha. We don't have time to go into the various functions of these components of the hypoxia-inducible factor systems. But the astonishing thing is, HAF1 alpha is produced by every single cell that we possess. And in the presence of sufficient oxygen, it is continually destroyed by the von Hippel Lindau protein. What an extraordinary thing to do, to continually produce a protein and have it continually destroyed. So, what happens when the oxygen level falls, the von Hippel Lindau protein falls, less of HIF1-alpha is destroyed and therefore its level rises. And once its level rises, then it upgrades things like vascular endothelial growth factor. Well, I want a, a slight digression at this point because I got to know the writings of a very extraordinary man when I was a teenager. John Burden Sanderson Haldane was an extraordinary man who was schooled by his father, John Scott Haldane, in biology. He became a biochemist. He had a degree in classics, and he fought in the Black Watch in the First World War as a captain in the explosives unit and declared that he enjoyed killing people. However, there was no doubt that his, um, his perhaps interaction with his fellow human beings was changed by that experience. However, he realized that the general level of scientific understanding in the population was very low. And so, at the beginning 
of the 1920s, he became editor of the communist paper, The Daily Worker, and started writing articles about science in The Daily Worker. His genius was picked up by the British Broadcasting Corporation, and in the 1930s, he made several broadcast lectures on aspects of science and compiled them into a little book which was printed during the Second World War on utility paper. This one's looking a little bit uh, um, down at heel. My brother was doing his national service in Palestine before it became Israel and sustained an injury driving a, a truck, ended up in hospital and then rehabilitated in the 13th field ambulance section and this little book was on the shelf, and he stole it. And so that's how I came to see it in the house, and I was riveted reading this book. Um, why I'm a materialist. Yeah, very, very superb series of essays. The after effects of exposure of men to carbon dioxide related to the submarine, the Thetis, which sank in Liverpool Bay, and my father should have been on board as part of a visiting group but was ill and didn't actually attend the first sea trial. If he had, I wouldn't be here. A study of the haemophilia in the royal households of Europe, JBS Haldane sorted out the genetic tree of this astonishing link. And, of course, everybody knows the story of the Tsarina and Rasputin and, of course, the other stories about uh, the Russian Revolution. But it's this last one I want to draw your attention to, Some Adventures of a Physiologist. Because this related to time that he spent with his father in 1924 attending a British, British Association for the Advancement of Science meeting. And he actually, the father remembered his way, he asked to speak at this meeting, remembered his way about the town from being in the sewer system. So what's the story of this very remarkable man and his association with this university? University College Dundee was founded in 1883 and one of the first departments to be started was by Thomas Carnelli, the Department of Chemistry, John Scott Haldane, the son of J.B.S. Haldane, had just completed his medical degrees in Edinburgh and wanted a job and decided he didn't want to continue in medicine for a variety of reasons. And so he got a job as demonstrator in the Department of Chemistry in this university, University College. And Carnelli was interested in air quality and Haldane was interested in oxygen. And so they went down the sewers of Dundee to sample the air quality. They also, together with a, um, a policeman, a, a sergeant, would go to the tenement at night, knock on the doors at two o'clock in the morning, to take air samples from the, the tenements, where perhaps as many eight, as eight people were sleeping in a bed. And the problem, they thought, was that eight people in a little room, the oxygen was running out, and if there was a baby in the bed, the baby would die. So it was thought to be the mechanism for their high infant mortality. It didn't prove to be the case. The oxygen level was fine. CO2 level went up a bit, and it was smelly, but otherwise it was perfectly safe. So all of this led me to actually write a book, which is Oxygen and Brain, that was published in June last year. And it centers on John Scott Holding, a totally remarkable man, a true giant of medicine. And we all stand on the shoulders of giants. The family came from the Vikings. They owned most of the land around Glen Eagles between Perth and Stirling. Uh, they had property in Edinburgh. Haldane won the oldest prize in science, the Copley Medal. He also knew George, George Bruce, who put the coal mines under the Firth of Forth, and James Paraffin Young, who started the shale industry just to the west of Edinburgh Airport, very topical. Um, that became BP, British Petroleum, came to Dundee and then from Dundee went to Oxford and I'll show you a little bit more in the next slides. But this is the family home, 
still there, formed by Richard and Jenny Haldane, very close to the golf course at Glen Eagles. And uh, it was a, a, an original farmhouse that was developed in the 1860 to house the Haldane family. And here is Haldane on the right with Professor Thomas Carnelli on the left sampling air in the intercept sewer underneath Murraygate. So you have a man from one of the most arist aristocratic families in Scotland down a Dundee sewer. Quite, quite astonishing. Well, his next port of call uh, was rather more at market, New College, Oxford. And it perhaps will come as no surprise to you that Haldane's uncle was professor of physiology. So Haldane was appointed um, a fellow in New College, but he didn't leave his industrial in, uh, <coughs> concerns behind because Burden Sanderson, the professor, was interested in air quality and there was a series of mine disasters in South Wales that they were asked to investigate. And so Haldane set about devising apparatus because he realised, following a tragedy in the Tylerstown mine in the cholera disaster of 1894, where 57 men died, but only six due to the, due to the explosion, 51 died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And Haldane devised a reusable biological monitor he put a canary in the box, and if the canary fell off the perch, the likelihood was there was a carbon monoxide around. And then, it's known as humane apparatus, he would switch the oxygen on, the canary would climb back on the perch. So it's a superb reusable biological monitor. And the miners, well, as far as they were concerned, the canaries were pets. So uh, they became very popular. But here's Haldane in overalls and a hard hat, testing his apparatus down a mine. And when he traveled to mining disasters on the train, he always went in a boiler suit. So you could imagine the effect of these activities in the quadrangles of power at Oxford. Um, he obviously was expecting to get the chair in physiology when his uncle passed away, but was passed over. Well, <clears throat> some of you may know that I, when I came up to Dundee in 1972, the North Sea had pretty much just started. Um, the fields offshore of Aberdeen, Forties and so on, Argyll had been discovered. And by 1975, the fields north of the Shetland Islands had been discovered, Magnus. And the range of water depth in the northern sector of the North Sea is from about um, 80 metres up to 685 metres. But this was my first introduction to, to North Sea diving. I trained with the Royal Navy, and uh, my first trip offshore was to this drilling rig. And in those days, drilling rigs, internal to the structure, there would be a diving system, because a lot of the early diving required the attentions of divers. The, the construction on the seabed required diving attentions. And this particular uh, semi-submersible was being operated by the Continental Oil Company. It's known as Venture One. And it's in Block 29, which is just about straight eastward out of the Tay estuary. And the date's 1976. Well, of course, diving depends on the work done by John Scott Holding for the British Admiralty in 1907. At the turn of the last century, war reparations and, and planning was going on apace and of course led to the First World War. So a lot of diving and the Royal Navy was suffering a lot of cases of a condition called diver's palsy. It, it hit them from the waist down and they ended up in a wheelchair almost at epidemic proportions with some of the deep diving. And Haldane was asked by the Admiralty to investigate this and did a truly brilliant series of, of 
goat experiments, which is the closest they could get to human, and ended up with this report. So this is the kind of diving, the old-fashioned helmet diving, and uh, lowered on a stage. What Haldane devised was a way for a diver, having taken up excess nitrogen, to leave the bottom and come up in a series of stages. Well, <clears throat> this is underpinning the technique. Abundant evidence and when the excess of atmospheric pressure the diver's exposed to does not exceed about 1.2 atmospheres, so that's about, uh, about 40 feet, there is complete immunity from symptoms due to bubbles, however long the exposure to the compressed air may have been and however rapid the decompression. This became known as the no-stop decompression point. So a diver could go down and work at about 40 feet for as long as he liked and then come straight back. And what Haldane did not say, he didn't say there wouldn't be any bubbles, he said there wouldn't be any symptoms from the bubbles. And in saying that, he was absolutely right. Well, of course, developed technology, particularly in uh, the last 30 or so years, means that we can actually use ultrasound to detect bubbles. And these are the bubbles in the right atrium of a diver who's done a standard dive. This one is in the aorta. So there's no doubt at all that the sort of commercial dives that people are doing every day in the North Sea is causing bubbles that are in the circulation. The excess of gas supersaturation leads to the formation of gas. Now you might think that it should be pretty easy to work out what's going on. I mean, the physics should be painfully easy. Well, it isn't. The physicists are still arguing about how bubbles arise. In fact, they arise in the human body in, in sheets of adjacent tissues and may or may not access the circulation. So what appeared at first sight to be a fairly simple bit of physics and, and you know, a little like chicken top of a lemonade bottle turns out to be very much more complicated when it's in a biological system. But the reason for this bubble, incidentally, the ultrasound scan takes a little while to do, so what would be a round bubble looks like a flying saucer. This one actually has gone through the lungs. And that is then potentially dangerous. Well, Haldane's classification, you all know of the pain and perhaps the skin rashes that he classified as type 1, and then the chokes, respiratory distress, but here's the problem, neurological symptoms, because by the time Haldane's methods had been adopted, they didn't see convulsions and death, type 3. But what they saw was that some of the animals, some of the goats, developed paralysis from the waist down. So here was a very tangible event, the formation of bowls and paraplegia. And to relate those two events, it would seem reasonable to suggest that bubbles getting into the circulation finally ended up in the spinal cord. Well, if I could single out one statement by John Scott Holday that stands head and shoulders above pretty much anything else he wrote, it would be this one. So a diver goes down, he's breathing air, takes up an excess of nitrogen, or he's breathing on helium, an excess of helium, and having taken on an excess of gas, when he lowers the pressure coming back to the surface, it, the bubbles can form an end to the bloodstream. So the first notable thing is small. These are some very small bubbles. They can be the order of about twice the diameter of a red blood cell, that, that sort of order. And then he says something very remarkable, that they can pass through the lung capillaries. So what he's suggesting is that the lung microcirculation is forming a trap, preventing material, which is on the systemic side, from passing through and therefore not reaching key centres like the brain or the spinal cord. An entrapment. We now know that megakaryocytes produced in the bone marrow are too large to pass through the lung. 
they're sequestered in the lung, and that's where platelets are released, which is a brilliant bit of hydraulics. God's definitely a hydraulic engineer, because releasing platelets into highly uh, oxygenated arterial blood that's then widely distributed is a perfect system. So, all they then say is that they can go through the lung and go through down to the spinal cord, which has a high nitrogen load because it's off-gassing slowly. And they may then increase in size and produce serious blockage in the circulation or direct mechanical damage. So the old concept that you put a bubble in that capillary and it's going to block it and that's the end of it, it's simple blockage, is totally wrong. He got it right by saying direct mechanical damage. Now, I do wish I had time to go into the work that I did with Professor Brian Hills in Houston on the constitution of the endothelium with substances called surfactant, which are boundary lubricants. Um, the, the whole circulation is engineered to produce minimal friction and to prevent endothelial damage by having adsorbed, not ad, adsorbed surfactants. Fascinating work. And Brian Hill should have got the Nobel Prize for this study. So, I worked with him, as I said, in Houston, and we did, I don't like animal experiments, especially if we could do them in people. Um, but what we did very simply was use very accurately sized micro bubbles directly into the carotid artery. These sized micro bubbles were of the order of 15 plus or minus two and a half microns, with this red cell, of course, being about seven. They were direct, injected directly into the carotid artery. Every animal that we did this to, we did a control plasma injection. And you can see, followed by tripan blue. And that's the hemisphere of the right carotid artery. So this built on other work that micro bubbles in the circulation open the blood brain barrier. And they do it very rapidly. So here are two principles of disease. The lungs, by forming a trap in the circulation, prevent large particulates going through and being supplied to the nervous system. And also, the second principle, microemboli can damage the blood-brain barrier. We're all familiar with large emboli, and blockage of major vessels, but microemboli can damage the blood-brain barrier. And in doing so, they set up edema and inflammation. Well, the end result of this kind of microvascular damage in the spinal cord is shown here in this post-mortem material from the um, spinal cord of a diver. And you can see the demyelination in the posterior columns, some in the lateral columns. I presented this slide and talked about a common human disease. It's called multiple sclerosis because under a microscope, it's impossible to tell the difference. Microscopically, between the histology in this picture and the histology of MS. So is that perhaps a clue? Well, <clears throat> if you actually really insult the spinal cord, end up <coughs> with hemorrhages. These are peridinous hemorrhages, and this is from my friend David Elliott. And these perivenous hemorrhages are associated with a very unusual and just discovered phenomenon. It's due to neutrophil attraction. And this is microbubble damage to the endothelial surface causing neutrophil sequestration on the surface. They then burrow through into the tissue, release free radicals, and this is microbial killing, but there are no microbes. Aseptic inflammation. And so the hemorrhages, these hemorrhages are not associated with infection, they're associated with microembolism. Well, happily today we don't need people to die to be able to look inside the nervous system. And this is the brain MRI of a diver. It's a very ancient one and not very high quality. I organized this for a diver in Long Island in New York and I'm sure you've all by now seen a little white area that um, 
are jocularly referred to by neurologists as unidentified bright objects on the basis of unidentified flying objects. So there you are, you can see, and this actually is a very critical part of the brain. It's very close to an end arterial system, but it also has zones where the nutrition is provided by veins. So this is the Achilles heel of the brain, and it links perinatal damage, multiple sclerosis, and stroke damage in, in the elderly. However, of course, as you all know, the spinal cord can be imaged. This is the same patient, and hopefully you can see an area there. Now, again, if there wasn't a history of diving, this patient could well be labelled as having multiple sclerosis. Well, I have to cover a little bit more of John Scott Haldane's extraordinary work because he was the first man to recognise that giving oxygen should be as a treatment, not as a supplement to ensure hemoglobin saturation, but as a treatment to correct tissue hypoxia. Um, in the First World War, the Germans used chlorine gas at Ypres, 6,000 cylinders on the top of a hillside, and rolled the gas down onto the Allied troops, Canadian, French, and then British, and killed thousands. Kitchener contacted Haldane at his laboratory in Oxford and asked him to go immediately to the front. He, uh, he went by London and was joined by Professor Baker from Imperial College. They got the ferry, ferry across the channel and then were taken up to the front and then did the post-mortem examinations and realised that chlorine, of course, forms hydrochloric acid and you get acute pulmonary edema, which, of course, kills. And, of course, terrifyingly, the men got the chlorine in the eyes and so they were blinded. And Haldane set about doing two things. One was devising protective apparatus and, again, his experience in mining disasters gave him a head start. Second thing he did was to devise portable apparatus to be taken to the front so that the soldiers could receive 100% oxygen. So the first time in the history of medicine, a tight-fitting oronasal mask and pure oxygen to treat lung conditions. There is something of an irony in that because there is a problem in giving continuous oxygen to people who have lung conditions. However, I can explain the background to that, but we don't have time. But nevertheless, what he showed was that acute inflammation in the lung can actually be cured by the administration of oxygen. Well, <clears throat> in 1915, the year the Lusitania was torpedoed off the Kinsale Head in South Island, Haldane was invited by now renowned for his work, to give a series of lectures in America. Um, the Lusitania, of course, had been torpedoed, so it was intrinsically dangerous to take a big passenger liner across the Atlantic, despite it, more assurances from the Germans that they were not going to uh, torpedo them. So all they waited till the next year to go to Yale University to give a series of lectures, the Ellis Silliman Lectures, and sail in October of 1916 on the Mauritania. It was his second trip to America. He went across to climb Pikes Peak and do all the work on, on hypoxia at altitude in 1911. He managed to get across, he gave the lectures, and all the lecture notes were kept together and eventually compiled into a book released in 1922. Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary uh, effort. And again, to show you the extraordinary range of this man's interest, he'd helped balloonists in the latter part of the 19th century to gain high altitude. And then, of course, the Wright brothers, 1903, and then the military growth of aviation. And after the First World War, the growth of passenger transport. And Haldane, along with uh, Sir Robert Davis, devised this compartment in the aeroplane which could be pressurised. 
Uh, the pilots weren't so lucky. They were actually in pressure suits called stratospheric suits in the cockpit. But this is the first design of pressurized aircraft, and that is the interior of a jumbo jet, a Boeing 747, the 200 series, which is uh, on stilts in the middle of the German town Speyer. Very complex. But really, if they hit the ground, it's a bit like confetti. They also uh, have a tendency to fail occasionally, and this is a very unusual type of failure. The aircraft carry high pressure oxygen bottles so that if there's a depressurization at altitude, the little masts drop down and the, the, the passengers have something to breathe. Um, the oxygen bottles are stored in a cargo hole, and this aircraft had just gone through 24,000 feet when an oxygen bottle exploded and blew this great hole in the side of the aircraft. Um, the irony being that it was actually the oxygen supply to the pilot and co-pilot that had exploded. <laughs> so everybody else could get some oxygen, but the guys in the front bit of the airplane, rather important people, they didn't get any oxygen. However, 24,000 feet is not particularly high. Put the nose down, get down to about 12,000 and everything's fine. But as you can see, all, all of the masts deployed in the cabin, as they should, um, we don't have any controlled trials of this intervention. Um, I don't know of a single double-blind study that supports the use of this um, su uh, respiratory support, uh, but I doubt that any doctor on that aircraft would have refused to put the mask on because of ed evidence-debased medicine. Here is an astonishing statistic, and I really must press on. Over a three-year period, the number of passenger journeys made equals the population of the Earth. We all fly about the world in hyperbaric chambers equipped with oxygen systems, which, if left on the ground, would make superb intensive care units. Look at that, 7.1 billion passenger journeys every three years. And, of course, that's neglecting the fact that we're flying tomatoes from Guatemala. But I, again, I couldn't resist putting this aircraft in, and perhaps not too many people in this audience will remember the Gary Powers incident, where this aircraft, high-altitude spy plane, was being flown from Turkey across to uh, Norway over the Soviet Union. And at that time, the Soviet Union did not have any air-to-air missiles, air-to-air missiles capable of hitting anything at 70,000 feet. But they did eventually, and they knocked it out of the sky, and Gary Power bailed out and was captured by a farmer. Um, he was eventually exchanged in the middle of Berlin for a top-level Soviet spy, so it was all dramatic. But in order to fly these, not only must the cockpit be pressurised, the pilot has to wear a pressure suit. And that derives from Haldane's work. This is Haldane's original stratospheric suit, which he devised for the balloonists, and then the high-altitude pilots who got the world records in the 1930s. All down to Holday. Well, you two pilots get brain damage. Not really comfortable to think of that. It's dangerous enough to be up there, and they're not very easy aircraft to fly. Why can't a hyperintensity on MRI and high-altitude pilots? Well, don't go into too much detail, but there they are. And, of course, what they've done is do a control study. And guess what, of course? They're controls. Completely healthy, synchronous people have white matter and hyperintensities. Still called by many neurologists <coughs> UBOs, unidentified bright objects. But the rate in the pilots flying to these enormous altitudes is twice that of the normal population. And the distribution is different as well, but... There they are. Well, of course, MRI has now reached superb definition. This is a seven Tesla magnet, magnet from New York. Uh, uh, Dr. V has kindly allowed me to reproduce it, where the perivenous nature of MS can be actually seen at this level of uh, definition. 
So MS is a perivenous disease of the nervous system and microembolism in divers cause perivenous damage in divers. Is there a link? Well, the other thing that, that patients with MS get are changes in the retina. These are the veins, and there you can see the leakage from the veins. 25% of patients who are given the label, it's not a diagnosis, given the label multiple sclerosis, 25% of them at some stage in their disease will develop retinal periphlebitis. There's no myelin in the retina. It can't be an autoimmune disease directed against myelin. There is no myelin in the retina. So the conflict, is it a blood vessel disease? Is it a tissue disease, i.e. autoimmunity, that dates from the 1860s, has been comprehensively answered? And this is a perfect example of a microembolic disease, fat embolism, with perivenous hemorrhages. Um, and on the basis of work that we did into this condition, I eventually published this in The Lancet in 18, in, uh, 18, should have been, in 1982, uh, uh, that there is a subacute version of fat embolism where the lung filter does not necessarily protect and where the damage in the nervous system will be perivenous demyelination and it will involve the cord. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> another interesting, very recent finding, um, cerebral emboli is a potential cause of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, a case-controlled study showing that the el elderly people are rather liable to develop endothelial damage in the brain associated with microembolism. Well, <clears throat> just to finish off very quickly, this is another wonderful statement from John Scott Haldane. Lack of oxygen not only stops the machine, it wrecks what we took to be machinery. Well, <clears throat> again, working in the North Sea, there were a number of unexplained deaths. This particular one related to a Norwegian engineering project to be able to lay a pipeline across the Norwegian trench. Because the Norwegian oil was here, there's the trench, and this is a minimum depth of 310 meters, 1,000 feet. So they wanted to be laid, to be laid pipeline or across the trench. But if you lay pipeline, you have to be able to repair it. So in 1978, this barge was in a Norwegian fjord. You can see it's January with snow on the hills. And divers made a dive to 1,000 feet in this equipment. That's the equipment. We're talking about $25 million worth of, uh, of, of engineering. And this actually uh, is, it goes over a, a pipe that's damaged in the center and then a box goes over the pipe that gas is, is pumped into, and there you can see a weld, a T-piece. So it's been cut out, the damaged section's been cut out, and this has been welded in. And this is high-tech. This, this is happening all the time in the North Sea because the steel structures are corroding, and Piper Alpha, of course, have corroded very badly. Well, at 310 metres, the absolute pressure is 32 times the pressure in this room. The oxygen partial pressure we want to use is three times what you're breathing in this room. We're leaving the balance helium, and that's the gas that's sent down to a diver. 98.1% helium, 1.9% oxygen. A little uncomfortable to just have 1.9% oxygen, but it's all made up on shore and supplied only they ran short of it, and this machine had to be employed to add a gas, because they'd run low of the premix gas. Instead of adding that 1.9% oxygen, it was pure helium. And so a 27-year-old diver died very quickly, and that's his brain. Look at all the hemorrhages, full of hemorrhages. Acute blood-brain barrier failure, edema, plasma protein leakage, red cells, free radical damage, myelin damage. So the neutrophil is involved in this process. Well, in the same year, 1978, I was involved with a company that had set up its headquarters in Dundee, Conoco, and this international underwater contractor company at the North Sea Medical Center, Hyperbaric Center. 
between the corner of this building and this building, there's the Aberdeen Railway Line and Dock Street, so it's kind of foreshortened. However, the building's still there, it's called Tayside Homes, but at this time, we did the demonstration in September of 1978 of transporting a diver in pressure chambers from East Shetland all the way to Dundee, continually under pressure. So there are in fact two divers in, inside this, this chamber. Well, a number of us felt that it was very unlikely that divers would actually need evacuation for illness or injury. It would be much more likely that they need to be taken out of a system which was threatened with fire or with sinking. So one Friday afternoon, eight people went into this little chamber to see how long the carbon dioxide could be controlled. Because in a helicopter, you can't carry gas to flush it through. You've got to run a CO2 absorber. Only they made a very basic mistake. They coupled up to what they thought was an oxygen bottle. Green is the colour coding for oxygen in America. This hose, and it wasn't. It had been emptied and filled with pure helium. So instead of putting oxygen in to replace the oxygen these eight people were breathing, they were putting helium. So the oxygen level was falling. Gas analyzer needle was going down. And then one of the divers inside collapsed. And so divers being divers, what you do, you put an oxygen mask on his face. And that was giving him pure helium. I was cold, I was in my office, and I drove down at breakneck speed. And I can remember going along the cobblestones, the shutter of the building was open, the white chain was outside, I went inside, and here was a man as close to death as I'd ever seen. He was grey, he was barely breathing, no pulse, peripheral pulse, he's got a weak pulse of the carotid, and I had no idea what they'd done. I had no idea that they'd actually given him helium. But fortunately, somebody discovered that without telling me, and I decided I was going to put him back in the chain. By this time, we have got the compressor part on. I put him back in, and I watched a miracle. This was a man, as I said, as close to death as I've ever seen, barely breathing. So now I'm pressurising twice atmospheric pressure, twice the pressure in this room, giving him genuinely 100% oxygen, not helium. Within half an hour, his eyes were opening, and then he started moving. And then I had a very uncomfortable time, because he kept staring at me. And he's a big guy. Anyway, after about an hour, I took the mask off, and he was beginning to be able to speak. And uh, some like, something like two hours, he was laughing and joking with me in the chamber, and told me, why are you staring at me? Because he be remembered being there with a girl, six divers, and now he woke up and I was there. How, how did you do that? So, obviously, uh, a very good point. What I didn't realise in giving him oxygen at twice the level that you can give in intensive care, that I was giving him the optimum treatment. Let me just show you. This is a piece of hyperbaric history in Scotland. 1959, hyperbaric operating theatres were placed on the roof of the Western Infirmary by Sir Charles Zillingworth. And they did heart operations with one hour of circulatory arrest with hypothermia and hyperbaric oxygen conditions. One hour of circulatory arrest without brain damage in order to replace the bar. But other things were done. And this little piece of work is a link to Dundee because the first author became the senior neurosurgeon in Dundee, Ivan Jacobson. Let me just talk you through it. Very simply, giving oxygen at twice atmospheric pressure, 100%, drops the blood flow through the brain by about 20%. Look at the arterial oxygen tension. It goes from 100 to 1,000, roughly, and the venous tension only from 50 to 70. And it's only by having a chamber and going to twice atmospheric pressure that you can get this modest elevation in the venous oxygen tension which reflects the cellular oxygen tension. That was published in The Lancet in 1963. But there's only one way to reduce blood flow and improve oxygen transport, and that's to give more oxygen. And there you can see the dissolved oxygen content goes up as you increase the pressure, until eventually you don't need red cells at all, 
and the paper Life Without Blood was published in 1959. What's the American attitude to hypoxia? I beg your pardon. Cerebral hypoxia, the latest information, what do you do? Mechanical ventilation, fluids, blood products, support blood pressure, and medications to suppress seizures. There's no recommendation to give more oxygen for cerebral hypoxia. How bizarre. Well, this particular case, this lady was a patient of my friend Paul Sianski in San Pablo, across the bay from San Francisco. And she just handed her son to Father Christmas in a grotto when a light aircraft crash, crashed on the shopping mall and she was enveloped in a fireball of flaming gasoline. And so this is after admission, and she's having what I call homeopathic oxygen. But of course, this means that she can have had carbon monoxide poisoning, products of plastic, isocyanates, um, um, and hydrogen cyanide poisoning, and so she was put in a chair. So between this picture and the next one, is just two sessions in one day. Well, her eyes are open, her mouth is closed, some of the swelling's reduced. Six sessions over three days, and then the final result. So if it's your face, and I can tell you that there is no risk attached to doing this, then my suspicion is that you would say, yes, I'll have that, thank you. Especially when taking what happened in the 77 bombing, the young lady involved wore a plastic mask for two years to keep the swelling down. We've had carbon monoxide patients treated during my time in the hospital. Simply wheel out an intensive care bed and push in a chamber. This is the old Vickers chamber we used to use. And the patient has no monitoring. Not interested in the ECG. If they're breathing, they're fine. And again, you see a miracle. You see a miracle. You see somebody totally moribund within an hour looking at you, wondering why on earth they're in this plastic sleeve. But one story which I can't resist telling you about is a little girl who got trapped down a mine for 58 hours in the back garden of a house in Midland, Texas, which is more famous for the Bush administration. And it took 58 hours to get her out a leg had been trapped underneath her and was black, and uh, that's the water well that she fell down on a little shoe. Anyway, the surgeon thought the leg was to be amputated, it was saved using hyperbaric oxygen treatment at Midland Memorial, and within months a letter in JAMA said it should not have been used. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment shouldn't have been used because oxygen produces free radicals. Forget the fact the leg got better and were saved, it's this theoretical ob um, objection. Well, in fact, that piece, that rescue, led to a piece of work done by a man called Zamboni in Springfield, Illinois, in which he ligatured the supply to a muscle, to a psoas muscle in a rat, for four hours. And if you let the supply go, it dies. It undergoes necrosis. If you give one hour of oxygen when you let the ligature go, it remains perfectly normal. And the reason is that this collection of white cells, when you let the ligature go, neutrophils latch onto the endothelium of the muscle, migrate through the wall, and release free radicals. And then you get necrosis. But one hour of oxygen, and Zamboni was able to extend the reimplantation time for severed limbs to 12 hours. Well, <clears throat> this is where things are going now. Infection, using hyperbaric treatment for multi organ failure, things like Ebola, reperfusion injury to improve organ transplantation, post cardiac arrest, limb reimplantation. And this is an uncomfortable piece of work that eight hours after death at normal post mortem examination, the brain is not dead, it's still functioning. However, you can't resuscitate it because as soon as you return the circulation, then you get reperfusion injury. And uh, here's a paper in the Lancet about it. So I'll go over that slide. Hemoglobin saturation has become a clinical constant. 
but it's the plasma tension, the dissolved oxygen tension, that is determining oxygen transport to tissue. So, what does the BNF say? Oxygen should be regarded as a drug. I fully agree that it should be viewed in the same category as, as drugs because of its pharmacological properties. Then they say an inappropriate concentration may have serious or even lethal effects. Being mischievous with a colleague we wrote in the 1990s to ask them whether the inappropriate concentrations they're referring to are too much or too little. Well, it's an obvious question, isn't it? Obviously, too little kills everybody. We got an acknowledgement of the letter, but no answer. So NHS status, air embolism, decompression sickness, carbon monoxide poisoning. And what an irony. We now know all of these are associated with neutrophil damage. So <clears throat> I think I'll end there. Um, putting this all together, is meant going through a vast amount of data where I'm acutely aware um, people have spent their lives. In terms of the amount of work presented in the book that's mine, or mine and my colleagues, it's relatively small. But that's inevitable in such a vast subject. But basically, where I'm objecting is the decline of the anecdote. You can have facts or stats. The facts are what happens to the patients. Remember, we are all anecdotes. There were a series of four articles in the, in the Lancet a few years ago treating individuals. We never treat anything other than an individual. We don't group people together, make a common esophagus, and put a big pill into the group. Every single treatment is the treatment of an individual. And I think we've gone massively off the rails. But particularly if we are trying use drug-based criteria to assess oxygen. If you're dying of starvation, you need food. If you're dehydrated, you need water. If you're short of oxygen, you need oxygen. And there is no substitute. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have run slightly over time. I'm aware you need to get away. Um, perhaps I'll not ask for questions, but if you do have any individual questions, I'm sure Professor James will take them here afterwards. Thanks for coming. Next week, Professor Philip Cahir talks about his life and career in NHS Tayside. Thank you very much for coming. See you next week. <laughs>